Today I'm joined by Lee McDermott. Olympian 1996, two times Commonwealth champion representing England in gymnastics. Welcome, Lee. Hi, how are you doing, Christian? I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah, very good today. <clears throat> you, are an, you are an Englishman in Down Under. What took you to Down Under? Is it the weather? <laughs> yes, the weather is a little bit better uh, down this side of the world. Um, I moved uh, to New Zealand in 2000, actually, uh, after I finished my gymnastics career. And um, yeah, I moved. I didn't have a clue who I, what I was going to do or anything. I just moved to New Zealand. And then within about 18 months, two years, I ended up as national coach of gymnastics. Okay. So, uh, so Southern Hemisphere has been my life, mostly. Since 2000. Yes. Okay, cool. In your life as an athlete, what was your darkest moment? Darkest moment? <clears throat> uh, probably snapping my ACL. Uh, and um, I, was, I was on a very good, good trajectory uh, but, but before that. And then, uh, so that was after Olympics in 96. Um, I snapped my ACL, uh, rehabbed to, to come back. I came back to full fitness and um, just kept tweaking and tweaking my knee again and uh, really got to the point in 1999 where I decided that it was, it was just too much and I, my body couldn't take it anymore. Is that when you decided to retire? Yes. So that was uh, in December 1999. What was uh, the, the moment of... Uh, of realization that um, my, my mind wanted to keep going, but my body just couldn't do it anymore. Okay. Is that also what brought you into what you're doing now, the kind of physical preparation, strength and conditioning work? That's a really good question. I never really related the two, but uh, to be honest, the experiences that I'd had through, through my gym career and having to rehab and, uh, and having to do that quite a lot, I guess it has a big relation, yes. Yeah, because from what I'm, I mean, we will speak about that later, but for, from what I'm seeing, the videos you're sharing of the work you're currently doing, I think a lot of these this <coughs> activities that you are doing, they are preventative of ACL Absolutely. injuries. Absolutely. Well. It's uh, preventative, not just in a uh, one-dimensional way, but really with, with spatial awareness movement patterns, and that's from... AC joint in the shoulders, ACLs in the knee. Okay, so let's get back to that moment. So how did you recover from it? You, it was probably prior or you had, to, you had to let go of your dreams of becoming a double Olympian. How did you recover from that moment? Yes, there was a good chance that I could have been a double Olympian in uh, 2000. And that would have been great to have done the Centennial Olympics and then the uh, 2000 Olympics. That would have been just absolutely awesome. Um, I think, I think after the injury in 97, I knew that it was always going to be a struggle. Um, but I'm, to be honest, I'm very stubborn. And, uh, and no one was going to tell me that I was finished. So uh, I think I had to make that decision myself. And um, there was a few people that wanted to and did tell me that I was finished. But... Um, I still went to Com Games in 1998 and was still able to compete and still be successful. So um, I guess I just wanted to keep that dream alive for a little bit longer. What was your best moment? Best moment? Um, I've had a few. <laughs> um, 96 uh, Olympics um, was, was an absolutely awesome uh, experience. And when they talk about uh, athletes being in the zone, I actually have very little rec recollection of competing because body was completely on autopilot. Um, but I just remember finishing and feeling, uh, feeling amazing. Um, but probably my best was winning Commonwealth Games gold in 1994 on rings and almost being the underdog. And having your national anthem played and standing up there is just an amazing feeling. What did you learn from that moment? 
I, I was a very quiet person and I actually missed some of the interviews after the competition because I was worried about um, standing in front of people and and talking and because my gym, my sport is my sport but having to be in front of the cameras and things was uh was something completely different and i learned that um and i try and teach my kids this that uh you don't have to be big-headed or anything like that but you need to be able to put yourself out there and uh and acknowledge your your successes as well and and be proud of your successes so um i try to put that on instill that into my into my kids as well um to acknowledge the the not so good stuff and also the also the the good stuff that happens in life as well yeah, really cool and um you mentioned that at the olympics you were in the zone and an autopilot why do you think that was because i think i had the best preparation possible <clears throat> um and when you know that you've prepared well uh your body goes into autopilot and if you're if you haven't prepared well your your body goes back to what it knows and if it hasn't prepared then it hasn't prepared and you you're you have more chance of failing when you've prepared well i believe that you've given yourself the best chance possible and so i feel that my body almost took over and um yeah that, that i all, all i can remember was lining up walking into the arena and having the basketball dream team on my left-hand side going into one arena and the gymnasts on the other side going into the other arena. So it's the tallest and the shortest mm -hmm. uh, of, um, and then finishing. And then I don't remember much in the middle. Yeah. I was asking because that, that answer actually comes back quite often that if people experience what you just outlined, it, they related to preparation and that they are fully prepared for yes. the moment. And then it just, happens almost automatically yes absolutely i agree yeah. if you could travel back in time 10 20 15 years uh, 10 20 years what advice would you give a younger lee a younger lee um oh my gosh that's that's a real that's a that's a tough question um prepare for when your uh, when your sport finishes Be, be, be better prepared for when your sport finishes. How would you I was very... Uh, I was... Uh, from the age of 10, uh, wanting to go to the Olympics was all I ever wanted to do. I, did, I never knew what that meant or how that... What, what it took to get there. All I knew that that's just something that I had to do. Um, and I didn't know whether that was going to be as an 18 or 20-year-old or a 40-year-old. I had no idea. Um, and I competed at uh, 20, uh, tw sorry, 22. And obviously I didn't look beyond, beyond <laughs> for too far beyond that at that time. Nowadays there's better, better preparation for, for athletes when they, um, when they're finishing their sport and there's better, um, support mechanisms around, uh, with also with mental health and things after, after finishing, um, our coaches did ask us to do those things but it was just uh i guess i was very narrow-minded at the time okay you participated in seven events at the olympics which not a lot of athletes do so that means you're a true all-rounder do you think if you would have doubled down on less less disciplines you would have been more successful It wasn't an option in those days. Uh, now, nowadays, the, the sport has changed where you can specialize a little bit more on, on a particular event. Uh, but in, but in, the, in the 90s, it was very much you had to be an all-rounder and you had to be pretty much an all-rounder to qualify for the Olympics. So um, it really wasn't much of an option in those days. Now, now, now you can specialize. Um, when I got to post-Olympics and we started to do Grand Prix competitions, We could specialize on each apparatus, um, but it, but it's a it's a different format. Okay. Yeah. What are the habits that make you a successful person or athlete? Habits. Yeah. Um, 
In, in, in what way, Christian? Because I, I see a lot of it as, as some mental toughness uh, and mental resilience uh, in there. And there's some stubbornness. There's, uh, there's work ethic. Like there, there, There's some stuff like that. But as far as habits, um, I tried to make sure that everything that I did had a purpose. Uh, so it wasn't just training for the sake of training. It was if I was training to make sure that your percentages were uh, at a particular level, or if you're if you're coming back from injury, make sure that every go counts, to, so that you're not you're maximising your training each time. And then it's okay to finish training early if you've uh, if you reached what what you've your goals are for the day. So I get I guess they they were were habits other than. Um, habits of going to competition I'd put my headphones on and listen to certain music. Um, they're, they're other habits, I guess. And the mental toughness part, how did you develop that? Or is it something that came natural? Honestly, I, d I don't really know, to, to, to be honest. It's always natural in, inside me. Um, I, I lived in a kind of rough part of London uh, as well. So... Um, there was a lot of uh, not necessarily with me but there was bullying going on or at school and um, there, there was uh, it was it was a rough part of London that's all I can say yeah and you you, you needed to be strong which so part was it? I, I, it was uh, South East London in Peckham in London South East I, I think I used to live there myself a little bit further down I used to work for the LTA so I lived outside London South East so I lived Orpington area yeah that that's that's a nicer uh, part, <laughs> part of town okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay cool um, after your career you have done some really interesting projects you were working with Cirque du Soleil yes. and um, so I read that you restructured the department how did you do uh, that it wasn't necessarily restructuring the department it was uh looking at gaps and looking at where we, where we can improve um so when when we'd moved when i'd gone to las vegas we'd looked at how how to incorporate the rehab uh with, with the training um components and when when you're coming back from from injury and you're you're stuck in a physio room uh rehabbing you're not really integrating so strong with the with the athletes or uh, or what's happening around you so really tried to um work with the physio teams to have a little bit more of a holistic approach to to that um maybe do some of their rehab in the theater whilst we were whilst we were performing so that they they can talk with their teammates if there was changes happening they were there on site uh looking at how things were were progressing and especially if you're on a longer term injury you know that things things change quite quick and you you need to be up to speed and then that way the rehab was a little bit faster mm. um and i think your, your men mental approach to, to coming back um you feel like you really want to get back and you feel feel engaged yeah so kind of return to play is it called nowadays return yeah, to play strategies much. Yeah, okay. so it was me with, with the physio team really working together and collaboratively. Yeah, okay. Um, considering you have been a gymnast yourself, a professional gymnast, and the Cirque du Soleil, on a, in a way, they are also performers, I mean, artists. Yes. What do you think are the similarities and what are the difference between professional gymnastics and the performing arts? Well, when, when, you're, when you're preparing as an athlete, you're, you're preparing from a, from a young age, whatever that is when you start, through, through your career. When you get to Cirque du Soleil, you, you've pretty much done most of your career. You've already got a lot of the, the physical patterns and physical attributes to, to be a high, high athlete. Um, you have a lot of um, work, work ethic and understanding what it, what it takes to, to be successful. When you go into Cirque du Soleil, You, um, you go there as an accomplished uh, sportsman or, or, or in your field, I guess. And it, there it's a matter of tweaking and nurturing and creating and using your attributes to, to the advantage of, of the show and really um, 
highlighting um, anything that you can bring to the table uh, so that so that the performance on a, on a daily basis is is out of this world and so I see it as that the in the athlete way you're doing all the preparation part but in the in the Cirque du Soleil you're nurturing all the parts and the components that you've mastered um, throughout your career and then highlighting those What's the structure like of uh, someone at Cirque du Soleil? How often a week do they perform, or what, what um, like on on tour? Uh, if they're traveling around, it's around 365 or something shows per year, and in Las Vegas, it's 476 roughly uh, shows per per year. Um, so you're in it for the long haul. There, there's a lot of performances that you have to perform throughout the year. And as a coach, your job is to always balance the workload. So it's just like any other strength and conditioning coach or coach in a sport that your, your job is to make sure that you're balancing workloads. You're looking at the athlete's well-being. You're, you're looking at the, the whole package. And then you, you, you base training accordingly for what, what's needed. And uh, it's essentially what you're taking your, your strengths as a coach Uh, in, into the same field. Yeah. yeah, I would think with such a high frequency, it's the main challenge is keeping the body together, right? Uh, yes and no. Uh, it, like I said, it, it's, it's the long haul. So it's, it's the mental approach to it. It's the physical approach. It's uh, mm. lifestyle. It's, it's everything around the performing and making sure that on a daily basis, we have the, we have the best show possible. Mm. Do you have a morning routine? Um, at the moment or when I was competing? Both. At the moment, it's driving the kids around and, and getting the school run done uh, before I go to work. Um, or if I have morning training uh, with the kids right now, I'll do morning training, school run, and then go back to work. So that's that's that. Um, at Cirque du Soleil, I wouldn't start till two, three o'clock in the afternoon and finish at 11, 11.30 at night. It's just a different, the same amount of hours, it's just a different shift of day. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, yeah, it does vary at the moment with, with the kids and family. And as an athlete? As an athlete, um, when I was at my national sports center, we were trained three times a day, most, mostly. Uh, half day, I think it was on a Thursday and a Sunday off. Uh, so it would literally be wake up, go to the gym, go have breakfast, have a little sleep, go back to the gym, have lunch have a little sleep and go back and train again and then have dinner in the evening. And then um, if, you, if you studied or anything, you'd probably do something towards the evening. Um, so I guess it was very, at the, at the time, a bit institutionalized and, and robotic. Uh, and then we had to find ways to, to keep that um, engagement going. How do you prepare yourself for important moments? Um... What, what kind of important moments? What, could you give me an example? For the Olympics, for example, as an athlete, <coughs> when you step into the arena, how did you prepare for that? Okay, so um, going into the Olympics, for me, the last week or two beforehand, it didn't really matter what, what I did in the gym because the, week, the weeks and months prior to that was actually the work that, um, and knowing that I'd done the work prior. Uh, for me... That was how it worked. Other athletes I know love to work right up to, to the given day, uh, making sure that, uh, that they're right in their, in their particular way. Uh, so I tended to routine-wise to back off just a little bit. And for me, it was more about feeling good, feeling that I can be successful, uh, but knowing I've done the work. How do you overcome setbacks? Uh, That's a really good question. Um, setbacks depend on the magnitude of the setback, I guess. Um, so if it's an ACL, you know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good six, nine, ten, twelve month uh, rehab. Um, uh, at the time, you have to go, this is what it is. And I think I'm quite good at compartmentalizing in my brain uh, of going, putting components in separate boxes. And, and trying to deal with each part in, individually. 
I get overwhelmed if I have to think of everything in its whole entirety. So I have to put things into boxes. Okay. Yeah, there's this, uh, it's some, it's on YouTube. It's the difference between how a man's brain works and a woman's brain. And the, <laughs> the guy actually, he talks about the, the men have different boxes in their brain. <laughs> yes. Uh, so something like and it, that. <laughs> and it, it's, it's, very, it's very simple in my brain, or I try and keep things very simple. If I'm competing or, or, or training, it was in one box. If it, life was in another box and I tried to really separate it, else it became too much and overwhelming. Who's your role model and why? Who was my role model? Uh, at the time, it was Neil Thomas, who was the first or one of the very first medalists at World, World Championships for Great Britain. Um, and I really, see, I really saw a shift change in um, you can do or you can achieve. Um, and when, when I used to spend time with him and, and a few other athletes, knowing that they, they were on the brink of, of making those medals or, or then just making those medals really inspired me. So, um, but I also love the underdog as well. And when, when that person comes through and, and really proves a point, um, I, I love that. And that, that's my stubborn side coming, coming out. What's the best advice you received and who gave it to you? The best advice um, was probably one of my very first coaches, Simon Moore. And um, he, he, he literally just kept telling me that if you think you can do something, um, then we'll make it happen. And um, I've been very much the, the type of person that if, if you've got the right mindset to something, um, on the most part, you'll probably be able to achieve it. So... It was, I think it was one of my very first coaches when I was like 12 years old. Hmm. Interesting. So just before puberty. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yes. Now I'm asking because it seems like a lot of, some to a lot of athletes actually have these so-called moments of ignition right before puberty. And then that carries through to them wanting to be successful and ultimately becoming successful. Yeah, and I think you have, you have these moments throughout your life uh, and you'll have these pivotal points that are key points where even if you try to forget it, you can't. It's, it's there. It's, it's in you. Yeah. Back in the days, a typical training day, you outlined already three sessions a day. How were the sessions structured differently over the course of a day? Yeah. So most of the time we would do our strength training and conditioning training in the morning. Um, then because we have six apparatus, we will do three apparatus in, in the middle session and three apparatus in the afternoon session, depending on when you're getting towards competition, things may change because you have your macro micro phases and things of getting ready for competition. Um, but that was, I guess, a, a, a standard type of day. You have shared some training impressions of what you're currently doing. And I mean, everyone should go and look at that. I think they are on LinkedIn at times. How do yes. you structure these sessions? I mean, what would the elements you're looking at that you put into one session? Um, definitely, uh, definitely a warm up component at the beginning, a very, a very uh, active, active warm up. Um, then, obviously, depending on the group, right? So, you, um, I think the most important part is to know your athletes first. So, um, and what are the strengths and weaknesses and working with the team that you're, you're, you're working with. The, the whole goal of everything was to uh, try to reduce injuries and try to work on the spatial awareness. So I started it as a very beginner gymnastic style um, routine. Uh, forward rolls, rolls over the left side, right side of the body, uh, falling backwards. Look at the competencies of, um, of each athlete and then make sure that the next training is adaptive. And I'm, I'm very much one that um, you have to look at the athletes and, and be an adaptive coach rather than uh, just purely a systematic uh, um, coach. I have always an idea of what I would like to achieve, um, but you, you, need to, you need to know your, you, the material you're working with. So again, then we'll, we'll go from the basics of gymnastics, fall, uh, rolling forwards, backwards, sideways, to um, 
basically it's, it starts with the basics, then work it at height, then work it with length, and then work it with height and length and rotation. Uh, and then you're increasing the, the, the knowledge uh, of the athlete from the beginning through that journey. Yeah, you already Does answered. that make sense? Absolutely. You just answered my next question that I've written down here, how you progress these activities. Okay, cool. Do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? Nominate someone? Um, there, there's a guy that I've, I've learned a lot about, a lot from, and that was a, a guy called Ben Darwin, uh, who was a, a rugby player for, um, for Australia. And I met him when I went to Japan and we got talking and we, we ended up good friends. So when I came to Australia, I lived with him for six months and he set up his own business um, about cohesion in sport and, and in business and how, how successful you can be as an athlete or, or as a team based on the relationships with you and your coach, you and your sponsor or you and your partners on the field. Mm. And he's a very interesting guy and very, very knowledgeable about um, how important it is to have that cohesion um, and stability within, within a structure. So yes, that would be my, my person who I, I have, I have learned a lot from. Yeah, it definitely sounds interesting. What's going on in your life at this moment in time? Uh, I'm the general manager at Southport gymnastics club uh, up on the, up on the gold coast in, in Australia. Uh, so I moved there for dis kind of December, January. Uh, so I'm doing that on a, on a daily basis. That's my normal job. Uh, then I'm working with the Gold Coast Suns once to twice a week on the falling, rolling protection uh, stuff once a week. Term two of school, I'll be working with uh, Palm Beach School uh, for their AFL Academy and uh, working on the same concepts of, of uh, so that by the time they can hopefully go through the talent pathway, they've already got knowledge and physical knowledge and mental knowledge of, uh, of what I've been doing. <clears throat> and the, the school has really embraced me, me coming on board, uh, especially when they they are the, the pathway and feeders through to the Gold Coast Suns AFL part. So I'm working with them. Uh, and I've connected with a guy called Ben Gollings, who's an ex-England Rugby Sevens player and who's working a lot in mental health space for, for kids, uh, but also athletes. And I'm just talking with him at the moment. I'd love to, I'd love to do some work, work with him as well. Mm. And the work you're doing, I saw the video clips on LinkedIn. Yes. Are there any other uh, platforms where you can see your work uh mostly it's been on linkedin just because i've kept it on that that professional level of of business uh i have to say that i've not been the greatest at putting stuff on instagram or or anything and i rely heavily on my wife for to help me with <laughs> with with that particular part um which is something i need to improve on yeah we're not digital natives aren't we <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I see that myself. I mean, my son and my daughter, it comes so natural to them. For me, it's still a yes. little bit Yes, yeah, my, my wife and daughter, same. Yeah. Where can people find you? Uh, just type in my name, Lee McDermott Olympian on LinkedIn, and uh, you should be able to have a look at the videos and things that I've been putting up there. And um, you're more than welcome to direct message me and uh, if you've got any questions. Awesome. Lee, thanks for your time. That was awesome. Cool. Thanks very much, Christian. Thank you.